in part by Light Beer from Miller. Everything you've always wanted in a beer and less. By GTE Yellow Pages, the first place to look for anything. And by Farm Stores, the fastest, freshest stores in town. And here's your host, Randy Scott. Welcome to the Coach John McKay Show. Yesterday in Dallas, the Bucks, another heartbreaking overtime loss. John took one of the best teams in the National Football League down to the wire and let him off the hook at the end. But I know a loss is hard to swallow as usual, but uh, would you agree it was one of the better efforts over all of the Bucks this season? Yeah, I thought it was one of the better <coughs> games that we played. Uh, again, we we end up finding ways to lose things, but I, I thought Sunday, I didn't say this yesterday in the press, that and this probably going to cost me quite a bit of money. That was the worst officiated football game in the history of the world. Not the second worst officiated. That's the worst officiated game where we even got called one time for tackling too hard. I didn't even know that you could tackle too hard. I thought that you allowed to really hit a guy. Uh, we get called for um, a pass interference on a ball that had been thrown through the goal post. It was going into the tunnel. Obviously a catchable ball. Yes, awfully catchable. The guy would have been able to <laughs> jump 60 feet straight up in the air. We got uh, snookered on a play where Dorset ran into the line. We tackled him. He was on the ground. He threw the ball back to White. He threw it down to our one-yard line where it was pass interference. The rules state if the man is in the grasp of a player on the ground, he is dead. Otherwise, the next guy comes in and kills him. Uh, I have never seen anything like that. Now, granted, we, we, sh we still should have won because we played as hard as we possibly can play. But when you go into that stadium and get that kind of uh, officiating, uh, it behooves me to say that I'd prefer never to play them there. I'd just soon give them the game there and have them sometimes come here and play us because uh, we just can't do it. It took the heart out of our football team, and they worked too hard to let that happen to them. I uh, noticed one replay on CBS where Gerald Carter obviously caught a ball, and they ruled it an incomplete Well, he caught the ball by you know three feet above the ground and the man standing there said it was good and the guy comes from 25 yards away and says he trapped the ball well everybody knew he didn't trap the ball except the one guy and the, the thing and it was an important play for us because we ended up punting a ball where we would have had a first down and uh, that went on all afternoon you know we had uh, 187 yards in penalties we almost had to take two shirts, different shirts, and put on Leroy Selman. They grabbed him so much that the last play when they scored, they tore, uh, turned him around and threw him to the ground, which is supposed to be, uh, well, I, there's no use going through it. It's, it was a very poorly officiated game. Whether we would have won had it been an officiated game is not the thing. I think we would have won in one handily. But when you're struggling as we were, and to get that kind of performance by the officials, and we will get... Uh, we will get confirmation today after we send the pictures to the league office that uh, they blew some calls and such. But that won't mean any difference. We will have a loss, and they will have a win. And uh, Dallas could afford a loss, but we couldn't afford a loss. Okay, coming up on the Coach John McKay Show, the Packers Varsity Tampa Youth Football League group is here with us today. We'll have a question and answer session with the coach from them and uh, look at the Bucks Man of the Year nominees, the three players from the Bucks who have been nominated. You'll have a chance to vote on that, by the way. Highlights of yesterday's game and some locker room comments. Stay with us on the Coach John McKay Show. <laughs> Back in the Coach John McKay show, the Bucks had the Cowboys on the ropes yesterday and, of course, lost in overtime 27-24. John, a, a loss is a loss, but uh, it seemed as though there were a lot of positive signs offensively. Uh, they moved the ball with more consistency this Well, week. I thought Thompson played his best game. I, 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 although I think Jack Thompson's going to be a fine, real fine quarterback, you do not come into the National Football League. Jackie's been an unfortunate youngster. He had four different coaches in college. Each year they fired the coach. He went to Cincinnati, and he had three different coaches. Cincinnati. Now he's come here and the, in the, in the, the papers are trying to get a poll to eliminate, make it eight different coaches. Uh, this is hard on a player, and especially a quarterback, because it's the terminology of the system in which that coach has, that he has to acquire, understand fully. Yesterday he audibilized twice, uh, once for 80 yards to uh, Jimmy Giles and once to uh, Carter for, I think, 53 yards. Uh, those things he couldn't see early in the season and how to get to those that quickly. 
because it's different. Uh, they, they're not going to, Dallas isn't going to stand there and say, here we come. They'll, they'll come late and they'll do those, and you have to look and get a key and say, i got to go to this. And he did a very fine job. I think he will continue to improve there. Therefore, I think our offense will continue to improve. Let's take a look at the highlights yesterday. An inspired defense took the field for the Buccaneers, and the first play we're going to see, I believe, is Mark Copney's interception, which gave you pretty good field position. Mark, over the years, of course, we just got him back this week. Has played awfully well against Dallas. Mark is a is a real tough football player. And that's Thompson, the house. And we have to settle for a field goal there because we do not pick up a blitz. Springs. Now that's a man-to-man -man coverage, and the guy that's got him is supposed to run 4-4, four, four, and the guy has got the ball on 4-7. So we've got a fast clock, and they've got a slow one. Here it is. They were in a blitz. Now that guy's got to catch him. And I think if Jimmy had been in, in camp long enough, he wouldn't have caught. Jimmy's still very fast. He runs about 4-5. This is James Owen going in from Thompson. And we're back in the lead again. We've never had any problems moving the ball against Dallas. We just never. This is a bad thing here Jimmy's doing. Jimmy should not swing the ball. That's a no-no. That's, that's really going to cost us in this football game. Twelve men on the field. I think oh, Twelve men on the field. Now, this is this is this is a manure call. Give it back to him on the one. You can only, only hold him out down there so long. There's the idiot cowboy. Like <laughs> Third quarter now. This one's the one that really gets to you. Well, I guess this is the one instead of going except. Now we missed the field goal. That's that that puts us in bad position. Also, we did not move the ball. It's, now this is the halftime that went forever. We were out back on the at halftime for about. Let's see O'Bell. There's the audible. Carter. Tiptoes down the sideline. Amazing he could beat on that same play. I think this is the one where we tackled too hard. Yeah. I'll be danged if I know it yet, but we did. I can, I'm trying to figure out what we're at. That man ought to be put in a sanitarium. I think we sacked uh, the youngster. And he is a very fine quarterback, by the way. Uh, and, uh, Danny White, he's a good player. Five sacks, I think, the Bucks had Just a great catch by Howard. It's a great run on a trap play by Jimmy Wilder. Now that ball is completely out of the end zone. See, that's about five yards out of the end zone. They call pass interference. And how you could have pass interference with a ball five yards out of the end zone. I mean, they almost didn't say we didn't catch that one, but could again. After that. Now Danny White's a little too off. There it is. Yes, ah. That guy run, doesn't run any faster than I do. Now That's going to set up the field goal. If we stop them and run into the kicker. Yeah, get that one right, you jolly green guy. <laughs> and that's it. Great effort by the Bucks comes up short in overtime. And uh, John, if you uh, 
analyzed yesterday's game, your defense uh, kept the pressure on Danny White pretty good. Play we, pretty we have always played Dallas, regardless of the so-called experts. Very, very fine defensive football. Uh, Sunday, we played our very best against him because Andy Hawkins, who is a real fine linebacker for us, nobody even knows he's on the team, but he started for four years for us at the left side, went out early, and we'll be out for six weeks with torn ligaments. So we had to, we got a young, youngster in on Thursday, Ed Judy from San Francisco, and he had to play the game. Now, it's pretty hard to come in and play our defense in two days practice. We do do a lot of different things and such. And what it did do, it forced us into a 42 defense with five defensive backs more than we would like to play because he really wasn't sure of some of the calls we would make, who he would have to take or what zone he would have to cover. But all in all, I think the defense played very well. We're much weaker now with Andy gone. Uh, we'll probably pick up somebody from East Strasburg State Teachers College, normal, and play them in there. But we have to have somebody to play in there, or we have to change our defense. If we change that, then we'll get weaker. Well, in the locker room after the game in Dallas, we spoke with some of the Buccaneer players, disheartened, of course. These were their comments. It's nobody to point the finger. Defense certainly ain't pointing the uh, finger to offense. Offense isn't pointing the finger to us. It was a team try today. We went out there as a football team and played our hearts out. And, uh, it's just really a crime that, that we wind up on the wrong end of the stick. We went into the ball game uh, prepared to uh, try and shut down whatever they were going to present to us. We were well aware of their, their running attack as well as their passing attack. Uh, we felt that they would open up the game uh, with the run and uh, later on they were trying to compensate it with the pass waiting for us to make some mistakes. I think we shut them down in, in both areas fairly well but we, we just came up a little short today. Well, you know, we feel good about ourselves. The character is there. It's obvious, you know, coming back from a, a game like it was last week against Green Bay and playing Dallas. Well, we all know Dallas is a super good team. And to play them the way we did today, uh, that says a lot for us. Although we didn't come up with the win, we're 0-6 right now. But our heads are still high. We still got the character. You know, and, uh, the fact of losing the six games we have and looking back how we lost, them, that's important to us right now. Eventually, we're going to get our first win and hope to get on the right track. Well, three of the Buccaneers have been nominated for the Man of the Year Award. We'll be back to meet them in just a moment. Stay with us on the Coach John McKay Show. Well, I'm sure most of you are aware that in the offseason, the Buccaneers are pretty much just as busy off the field as they are on during the season. And three of them have recently been nominated for the Man of the Year Award. We'll let you take a look at the three and then decide which one you'd like to vote for at Tampa Stadium this coming Sunday. Take a look. Uh, it, it was a surprise. It's an honor, and it's something that I'm fairly proud of. I was pretty lucky, I guess, to even be considered with uh, such guys as Dave Logan and Leroy Selman. I'm pretty pleased about it. Well, presently, uh, I'm involved with MS, Athletes Against MS, which is a national organization, and Steve Garvey is the head of that right now, and uh, I pretty much have just gotten involved with them on a national basis. We did do some things in the Bay Area and had a, an ugly bartender contest down here where we were fortunate enough to raise a, a fair amount of money for MS. Uh, was involved with a Boy Scout drive and trying to uh, maintain higher numbers of Boy Scouts at, at each individual uh, Boy Scout counseling group uh, as well. I've been involved with the Children's Home Society of Florida and that uh, they will become one of my premier uh, events and thrusts from now on. From here on out we're going to start to do a massive statewide campaign to help them out and see just exactly how much aid we can get for them. Well. Uh, for the most part, I've, uh, I've put together a uh, drug and alcohol abuse program along with continued education in the uh, Hillsborough uh, County. And uh, I have gone into at least 15 uh, different high schools and I've lectured to younger uh, kids about uh, the dangers of uh, alcohol and drug abuse and the importance of staying in school and furthering their education. And uh, it's been a very, uh, very wonderful program this, this far. We, got great response from it and uh, we hope to continue it in the future. Being the spokesman for the United Way because it's, in my opinion, one of the greatest charitable functions uh, in the history of the world at this point and uh, I can't say enough about it. it. It seems to focus on more than just one specific charity. It seems to cover everything and uh, the poster that we did uh, during training camp was uh, one we taken with uh, two young kids and uh, it's involving Blitz Day on the 20th. A lot of kids love to emulate us, so it's important that you have a good positive image because they're going to they're gonna try to repeat some of the things you do. And if you're doing the right things, then it's to your advantage because you're going to help them to, to lead a better, prosperous life for them. But if you are 
uh, under the influence or if you are having problems, then they may think that that's the correct and proper thing for them to do, and they may follow in your footsteps. Well, lately it's been three primarily, and it's been the um, United Negro College Fund and uh, Little West Hellman Run for Children's Center for Cancer and Blood Diseases and also Ronald McDonald House. Those have, have, have been the primary three that I've been uh, most directly involved with. Well, I would you know, definitely feel honored to, to get the award, but I think the real satisfaction comes out of the involvement that you have in the community and actually, you know, getting involved and working with different people in the community that work so hard, you know, and to see those people work hard is an inspiration to me to give a little bit more effort and the results is, is, is tremendous, you know, if you can help one person out, you know, it's all worthwhile and I think that's where the enjoyment of it all comes from, not necessarily getting an award or a plaque or, you know, anything like that. Of course, that's Leroy Selman, Dave Logan, and Sean Farrell. The three Buccaneers have been nominated for the Man of the Year Award, and you fans can vote for one of these three next Sunday at Tampa Stadium prior to the St. Louis Cardinals game. Be sure and get your ballot there. And we'll be right back to talk about the St. Louis Cardinals in a Q&A session with our guests in the studio on the Coach John McKay Show. Stay with us. Well, our guests at the studio this evening on the Coach John McKay Show are the Packers Varsity Tampa Youth Football League squad. And uh, the first one who has a question for Coach McKay is Dave Clifford. David? Yes. Coach McKay, if you could replay the Dallas game, is there anything you would change in your game plan? <clears throat> well, I don't know of any certain thing we would have to change. Dave. We had to change our game plan because of our injuries at defense. Uh, offensively, I think we did pretty much what we thought we could do. They're, they are a very good defensive team. And as I said, said previously, we've always moved the ball pretty well on them. So I don't know of anything. Uh, the big question in our mind is when we got the ball right at the end and there was very little time to play, whether we should try to make a first down by throwing, we knew they wouldn't let us do it running, or make them call timeouts. Uh, I decided that we would make them call timeouts. We ran three running plays. They called all three timeouts so that when we punted to them, uh, they were a long way away with no timeouts. I felt that was the best deal we could get. It turned out to be a wrong decision because they did score. Okay, next up is a tight end, Dennis Decker. Dennis? Step right up there, Dennis. Coach McKay, in a prevent defense, should the corner go for an interception in a close game situation? Absolutely not. You have to, uh, <clears throat> you have to allow the, uh, the completion. Uh, you really prefer the completion to be inbounds. <clears throat> I thought we didn't do that as well as we should have. Because, again, without timeouts, if the ball goes, is completed out of bounds, there is an automatic timeout if we tackle them inbounds. But you should never go for the interception when you're that far away because the, the field goal is not going to beat you. It, they have to run the ball in the end zone to beat you. Okay. And uh, Bill Green is a defensive end for the Largo varsity team. Bill? Do you, Coach McKay, do you think the long halftime helped to hurt the Bucks? It irritated me, but I don't think it hurt or helped us. Uh, they were honoring a very fine player in Roger Staubach. Uh, usually in that type of thing, somebody gets long-winded, and most of those things do go over time. Uh, I, I would appreciate it had he not asked us to come out uh, as early as we did, but it didn't hurt us in any way, I don't believe. Okay. Pretty good number for a defensive end there, too, by the way, 63. Jeff Huffman is a running back. Jeff? Great. Jerry. Jerry. Yes, Coach McKay. What did you tell your team about the penalties they had? Do you think it influenced the outcome? Well, I think uh, I, I said nothing after the game, as I'm prone not to do sometimes. Uh, I would rather wait and see the pictures, because sometimes you see something out there that you really don't see. It happens so quickly. Uh, our team was very angry about the calls. Uh, which sometimes they are and they're wrong about that. Uh, I got up at about 6 o'clock this morning and looked at the, the movies of the game. And uh, the team was right. We got, we got some of the darndest calls I have ever seen. Maybe when you're losing like we are at this time, this happens to you. And it becomes more paramount in your mind because you're wanting to win so badly. But uh, there was no way that about three or four of those calls were, they were just not right. And in, in essence, it gave Dallas 17 points. We cannot give Dallas 17 points and hope to beat them. Okay, thank you, thank you fellas. Good questions. John, 
Cardinals at Tampa Stadium next Sunday, a one and five team, but I'm sure you won't have to really motivate the Bucs. Listen, one and five teams, you know, the Car we got beat by Green Bay and everybody told me that.